Well, good afternoon, everyone. IDPH Director Dr. Ngaze Azike and I are joined today by the Illinois State Board of Education Superintendent, Dr. Carmen Ayala, as well as the Superintendent of Community Consolidated Schools District 168 in Salk Village, and uh, ISBE Vice Chairman, Dr. Donna Leak. As indicated by the lineup of our, today's guests, uh, our conversation today, of course, centers around our schools. Up until March 17th, your average school day saw two million students gathered in large groups in school districts all across Illinois. That's two million young people who would meet up with their friends in the classrooms and hallways during lunch, at sports practices and for extracurriculars, and then go home to their families, to their guardians or whoever else that they may see when they go home and uh, go wherever it is that they go next until the next morning, of course, when they do it all over again. That routine is a source of joy for so many, but it also opens up a nearly limitless opportunity for potential COVID-19 infection in a time when our healthcare workers, our researchers, our scientists, and our first responders need us to bend the curve downward. Folks, I've said time and time again, my decisions are hard ones but they will follow the science. And the science says our students can't go back to their normal routine. Therefore, I am suspending in-person learning in schools for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year. We know that there are many school districts with unique challenges and we will work with them on any issues that may arise. I know that many have felt that this was inevitable but trust me when I say this was not a decision that I made lightly. The importance of our schools and our in-person school days is not just a question of tradition and sentimentality, as essential as those things are. The shutting of in-person classroom time also risks a drop in instructional time, an extended window in which students can potentially experience summer learning loss and an educational landscape in which some districts have more experience with remote learning than others. These challenges weighed heavily on me as we came to this decision, but my priority remains unchanged. How do we save the most lives during this very difficult time? The answer to that question leaves us with only one path forward. Over the last month, Illinois schools have stepped up and faced the many challenges of COVID-19 with generosity and creativity and a resolute focus on caring for students and parents and communities. And I'm confident that our schools will manage and expand the learning opportunities for all of our children who will be working from home over the coming weeks. Why am I so confident in that? Well, because school districts of every makeup across the state have been hard at work doing just that for the last month already. Like in Dallas City, a Mississippi River school district on the border with Iowa, where more than half of the students have sporadic internet access or none at all. Dr. Michelle Lee, superintendent of Dallas City Elementary School District and La Harp Elementary School District has teamed up with the transportation director, bus drivers, and maintenance staff to personally deliver paper packets of instructional materials to Dallas City students. Not only that, but on their route, they're delivering meals to not just their young students, but also to older students in the area high school district, homeschooled students, and younger siblings. And Dr. Lee has teamed up with a local community organization to ensure that meals keep flowing on the weekends too. About 40 miles southeast of Dallas City and 40 miles northeast of Quincy, Superintendent Todd Fox has developed his own creative approach to supporting the Southeastern Community Unit School District where 65% of students are low income and nearly half of families lack reliable internet. Superintendent Fox is operating with paper packets as the base of their remote learning system so no students are left behind or left alone. 
Teachers log all of their communications with students and parents in an effort to support their social emotional health and cognitive development and submit their logs to the principals each week. In the words of Superintendent Fox, we're making connections to ensure our children are not stuck at home, but rather they're safe at home. South of Metro East Redbud Community Unit School District Superintendent Jonathan Tallman has worked with local internet providers to expand free service to families in need, handing out devices to students without equipment of their own. Redbud honored its graduating seniors on social media and offered area parents the opportunity to hear directly from Redbud administrators on Facebook Live. And in McCoupin County's Staunton Community Unit School District, south of Springfield, Superintendent Dan Cox has developed a remote learning plan for his P-12 student body that combines Google Classroom tools with offline continued learning kits, making the most of technology without being reliant on technology. Be assured, Illinois students are in good hands. Our teachers and our administrators are doing what they do best. They're stepping up to ensure that every child in this state receives the education that they deserve. Remote learning looks different in each of our communities and that's encouraged. Personalization in education is a very good thing. Some rely on paper and pencil methods more than digital and vice versa. Some rely on digital more than paper and pencil. Schools should be checking in with students every day. That can be done by logging on to an online system or by calling or by emailing. Those check-ins are not just about attendance. They help support our students through this difficult time. And to begin the work of preparing our classrooms for students' eventual return, I will be signing an executive order to modify licensing requirements for future educators who are nearly finished with their studies, like our student teachers, to ensure that this situation does not impact schools' ability to hire the qualified teachers that they need when students come back. There is $569 million to support our K-12 schools from the Federal CARES Act in response to COVID-19. Dollars that can help equip students with technology and internet access to enhance remote learning, support teachers in developing their remote instruction skills, and assist schools in continuing to provide meals to children and communities. Public school districts will receive a portion of this funding proportional to the number of low-income students that they serve, and ISBE will direct the remaining funds towards supporting our districts that need those resources most. My office and the Illinois State Board of Education is recommending that any grades given during this pandemic reflect the unprecedented circumstances in which students are attempting to continue their studies. That is, grades should deliver feedback and not be used as a tool for compliance. COVID-19 is forcing far too many of our students to deal firsthand with concepts that even adults find nerve wracking. Let's recognize that and be supportive of all of our students. Before I turn it over to Dr. Azike, I wanna offer a few thoughts to some of the people impacted by this decision. To the teachers who feel like they didn't get to say a proper goodbye to their students, my heart is with you. Know that your efforts reach your classrooms through new creative ways and that that means the world to your students and to me. To the special education instructors who might be facing particular challenges in making meaningful remote connections with their kids, I know you're working to build a unique response to a unique situation, and I'm so grateful for that. We must continue to reach all of our students in any way that we can. To the administrators who have dedicated themselves to transforming their districts overnight and doing everything that it takes to implement lo remote learning, whatever it looks like in your community, thank you. Every minute of instructional time that you can keep running will make a real difference for our children. To the parents who find themselves experiencing a whirl of emotions because, because of this pandemic, along with some extra stress with your kids at home all day, I promise you, you will get through this. 
And I want to remind everyone of our call for calm emotional support line, a free way to anonymously connect with a caring counselor at a local community health center, mental health center. You can text TALK or ABLAR to 552020. Text TALK, T-A-L-K, or in Spanish, ABLAR, H-A-B-L-A-R, to 552020. To our high school seniors who are leaving this phase of their teen years behind in a way that they never expected, I know you're feeling sad about missing the rituals of senior prom and senior pranks, senior nights, and of course, graduation. Hear it from me as your governor. There's room for you to feel all those things, big and small. You will get through this too. You will talk about this for the rest of your lives, and you will go on to do amazing things. I am very, very proud of you. And to children of all ages, this is a very strange moment that you're living in. Your parents and I didn't experience something like this when we were kids. But I can tell you for sure that the hard things we did live through, we learned from. And you're going to learn from this. You're going to see what it looks like when the world comes together. When it looks, what it looks like to put your faith in science and research and the teams of people here in Illinois and beyond who are working on treatments and vaccines to save lives. We will get to the other side of this, and that other side will be a place that appreciates the best of the before, but with a greater sense of compassion and connection. And the best part is that you are going to be the ones guiding us forward. All of you, with your creativity, your passion, and your care for others, are going to shape our future. Let me be the first to say, I can't wait to see all that you will accomplish. So now I'd like to bring up Dr. Zike for today's medical update. Doctor. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your announcement, and thank you for that heartfelt message to the students who are impacted as well. As a mother of a graduating senior, I'm sure my son heard you. Thank you. With today's announcement, I imagine parents and students might be missing their teachers and friends just a little bit more. However, I know that learning will continue to take place, but it will happen via e-learning at home. The science does show that social distancing works, and I hope people remember this and take it to heart. We won't abandon all the good that we've done. Today, unfortunately, I announce our largest number of new cases in a single day at 1,842 new cases and 62 additional lives lost to COVID-19. That brings our statewide total to 27,575 COVID cases and unfortunately 1,134 lives lost. I applaud Governor Pritzker for his decision making he never shies away from making difficult decisions that benefit us all. Every action he takes is thoroughly thought of with the people of Illinois in mind, and we thank him for his courage. Please, for people who are experiencing illness and want to get testing, I do want to alert that we do have increased testing capacity. Go to dph.illinois.gov forward slash COVID-19 to find sites where you can get tested. Please continue to stay home, continue washing your hands, wear a mask if you must leave. Everyone's effort is appreciated. It's noticed. Your efforts have shown that they can flatten the curve. I'm so proud to be in this state and see how we have responded to this pandemic. We'll continue fighting together. We're all in Illinois. And with that, I will translate my comments into Spanish. Buenos tardes. Con el anuncio de hoy, imaginó que los padres y estudiantes podrían extrañar un poco más a sus maestros y amigos. Sin embargo, las lecciones todavía deben seguir, y lo más importante deben quedarse en casa. La ciencia muestra que el distanciamiento físico funciona, y espero que la gente lo recuerda y lo tome en serio antes de abandonar todo el progreso que hemos tenido hasta ahora. 
hoy IDPH informa 1,842 casos nuevos que incluyen 62 vidas adicionales perdidos por COVID-19. Ahora tenemos 27,575 casos y 1,134 de ellos han sido muertes. Aplaudo al gobernador por las decisiones que hace cada día. Todas las acciones que toma piensa en la gente de Illinois primero. Por favor, quédense en casa. El esfuerzo de todos es apreciado y notado. Estoy orgullosa, orgullosa de la forma en que Illinois ha respondido a esta pandemia. Sigamos luchando juntos. Gracias. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Carmen Ayala, Superintendent of the School Board of Education. Thank you, Dr. Azike, and thank you, Governor, especially for your courageous leadership today and throughout this crisis. We know that these are not easy decisions to make. Voy a repetir este mensaje en español. Our school buildings may be closed, but the hearts and the minds of our teachers and students are wide open. Since the suspension of in-person instruction when it began on March 17th, Illinois schools statewide have risen to the challenge of holistically serving students in new and in different ways. Decatur Public Schools, for example, has partnered with local radio stations to provide stories and lessons on the air. Vienna High Schools has parked its school buses equipped with Wi-Fi hotspots in strategic locations throughout Johnson County to boost internet connectivity for students at home. And the Northwest Suburban Special Education Organization has pre-recorded videos using American Sign Language to read and sign stories to students with disabilities. This pandemic has altered the fabric of how we teach, how we learn, and how we connect. But it has not shaken the core of what our schools do, and that is to take care of Illinois' children and prepare them for what is next. Our schools focus on social and emotional skills like resiliency, empathy, and adaptability for this very reason. So when the unpredictable events in life knock us down, we have the strength and the mindset to get back up. Many of Illinois families are undergoing tremendous hardship, and we are committed to doing everything that we can so that schools can continue to serve as conduits to food, technology, and resources, not just to students, but to their families, to the elderly, and to entire communities. Marquardt District 15 comes to mind it's an elementary district west of Chicago. And we talk about the importance of making connections with our children every day. And in Marquardt, a social worker made a connection to a family to discover that in that family, they had a half a loaf of bread left with a mother that had no resources, no transportation, five children that she was trying to also educate. Because of this contact with this social worker, the Marquardt District was able to deliver five days worth of meals and milk for this family. That's how important the daily contact is. Taking attendance, which really means making contact with each and every student every day, is more important now than ever. And this regular engagement helps teachers gauge their students' needs their academic, social, emotional, and technological needs. Many families also do not have sufficient access to computers or internet at home, and we're going to tackle this digital divide head on as part of a strategic effort that will extend beyond the end of this pandemic. We will use the Illinois State Board of Education's Federal CARES Act dollars to increase access to technology and devices in our least resourced districts and we encourage school districts to use their CARES Act funding allocations for this purpose as well. 
closing the digital divide will be pivotal in fulfilling the agency's new post-pandemic strategic plan. But no matter how students are currently engaging with their schools, the Illinois State Board of Education does not expect families to try replicating their students' usual school experiences at home. We have published guidelines for how much time children should focus on purely academic work, and it ranges from as little as 30 minutes for our kindergartners to somewhere between two to five hours for our high school students. These recommendations are available on our website, isbe.net slash COVID-19, and they are available in English, Spanish, Polish, and Arabic. Will students return to school totally caught up? We're not expecting them to. The Illinois State Board of Education will be releasing transition guidance to help schools address learning loss and students' social emotional needs when they return to the classrooms, whenever that is safe to do so. In addition to the Call for Calm text support line, our agency website also has a page dedicated to mental health resources with guides for how to talk to children about this public health crisis and other resources. It's at isbe.net slash mental health. All our efforts are geared toward meeting our students where they are and giving them the tools and the supports they need for success. These efforts will not end even when the pandemic ends. Gracias, Gobernador, por su valiente liderazgo hoy y a lo largo de esta crisis. Sabemos que no son decisiones fáciles de tomar. Nuestros edificios escolares pueden estar cerrados, pero los corazones y las mentes de nuestros maestros y estudiantes están abiertos de par en par. Desde que se suspendió la enseñanza el 17 de marzo, las escuelas de todo el estado de Illinois han asumido el reto de servir holísticamente a los estudiantes de maneras nuevas y diferentes. Esta pandemia ha cambiado la forma como enseñamos. Aprendemos y conectamos, pero no ha alterado el núcleo de lo que hacen nuestras escuelas, y esa es cuidar de los niños de Illinois y prepararlos para lo que sigue. Muchas de las familias de nuestro estado están pasando por tremendas dificultades y nos comprometemos a seguir hablando todo, haciendo todo lo posible para que las escuelas puedan seguir sirviendo como conductos de alimentos, tecnología y recursos no solo para los estudiantes, sino también para sus familiares, para los ancianos y para comunidades enteras. Me viene, a, me viene a la mente un distrito escolar, el Distrito 15 de Marquardt. En este distrito escolar es, se encuentra al oeste de la ciudad. Un trabajador social llamó a la casa para ver cómo están los estudiantes y se encontró con una madre y con media libra de pan con cinco hijos tratando de enseñarlos sin recursos y sin transportación. Esta trabajadora social de nuestras escuelas inmediatamente regresó a la escuela y entregó cinco días de comida y leche a esta familia. Dificultades financieras, traumas, pérdida de aprendizaje y la brecha digital Estos son las dificultades que nuestros estudiantes están viviendo y que pesan en nuestras mentes y en nuestros corazones todos los días. Estamos desarrollando un plan de transición para ayudar a las escuelas a pensar en cómo apoyar a los estudiantes cuando regresen a los salones de clases en el otoño. Estamos anticipando el uso de los fondos federales del CARES Act para aumentar el acceso a la tecnología. Animamos a los distritos escolares a usar sus fondos también para este propósito. Ah, planes. Recuerden hace un par de meses cuando todos teníamos planes sobre cómo sería este año, cuando los viajes al trabajo y los horarios de, los, de las campanas nos ayudaron a planear nuestros días. Confío en nuestros líderes como los que están aquí hoy, en las escuelas, 
Confío en las maestras, los maestros, sobre todo el Estado, que venceremos esta tormenta juntos. I would like to introduce Dr. Donna Leek, Vice Chair of the Illinois State Board of Education, who is with us today as a current district superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Ayala, and thank you to Governor Pritzker for your leadership. It is an honor to be here today to represent the students, families, teachers, staff, administrators, and board members that make up Community Consolidated Schools District 168 in Sauk Village, Illinois. I am proud, like so many other superintendents, of each and every staff member and student who has stepped up during this global pandemic. Community engagement has been key to the success of remote learning days in our district. I was absolutely blown away by the number of community members that participated in our Facebook Live community coffee that I recently hosted. Through this connection, I learned more about the fact that our families in our community needed additional social and emotional supports. Our team put our heads together and developed a variety of opportunities to care for our community during this unprecedented time. Students, families, they're experiencing loss and grief right now. Their lives have been completely upended and schools are a valuable resource to help our families and students cope with this sudden transition to the unknown. In our district, our teachers are hosting virtual community circles each morning in order to allow their students support in social emotional needs, in addition to continuity in education. Our social workers and our counselors are available for students and their families to reach out for assistance at any time. We've had more than 400 of our students participate in a virtual lunch just to talk about what's going on. We're supporting student learning utilizing technology and when needed, paper packets. In particular, individualized instruction for those who need it most. Our students are staying engaged throughout the school day through the use of Google Hangout, Zoom. We're using Classroom Dojo and Powered by Action Network. Our special education teachers and teacher's aides are ensuring that the required minutes for our students with special needs are being met through technology. I am so proud, like every other superintendent in this state, I am so proud of our staff for rising to this occasion and finding new and creative ways to keep our students engaged. But not only are we supporting our students in terms of mental, emotional, and academic, but also nutrition. Our area has provided tens of thousands of meals to families across our district. Each day we work to ensure that our students have breakfast and a hot lunch, and in addition we have partnerships across the village to ensure that our families and seniors' needs are met. Throughout this process, I have spent time collaborating with my fellow superintendents. We share thoughts, ideas, and provide support to one another as we navigate through this unchartered water. We are all prepared to meet the demands that our communities will have to face with today's announcement, and we will continue to find creative and innovative solutions to support our families into this new future. And now I would like to turn it back over to Governor Pritzker for questions. Thank you. Reporters in the room, we're gonna do one question each. Marianne's got a few from the political reporters in town, so she's gonna get three. Great, thank Governor, you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, on the 569 million, mm -hmm. who will oversee that? Where will that money go? How will it be fairly distributed? Does that include Chicago and everywhere else? And if I can combine a question in one, Chicago, you're telling everybody no school, not just, uh, you know, it's public, private, the whole shebang. That's correct. Yeah, um, so the $569 million is, is defined in the CARES Act. A portion of it goes directly to schools, and then a portion of it is, um, is defined by ISBE and what the needs are across the state. So those decisions will get made about ISBE's portion of it based upon the needs of our school districts. We've had some questions from uh, some of my coworkers. Are you tracking the cases of po positive cases of coronavirus among health workers, healthcare workers? Do you know those numbers here in Illinois? And also, how many healthcare workers in Illinois have died? 
I, I'm going to turn over to Dr. ZK who can answer some of those questions for you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, yes. So, we have uh, all of those numbers in our database. Our INEDS database is, uh, is populated with information from our local county health departments as they manage the individual cases. Um, so, we know that there have been numbers of individuals who are health care workers, um, different different types of healthcare workers, and we can get to those numbers um, specifically so that you can keep those. I haven't reported out specifically on those, but I can get those for you. And the number who have died, why, why haven't you reported that yet? No, I actually haven't broken it out no. like that, so it's not, it's something that my team can assemble. We have, you know, occupational status for many of the, of the um, cases that are in the database, but we haven't broken it out like that, so we can get that for you. Thank you. How about McCormick Place? We understand that now there have been patients admitted. Yes. Are they only coronavirus patients? How sick are they? And tell us a little more about that. Yep. So I'll give you just the introduction because I was there this morning. Um, there are five uh, patients there uh, so far, um, and they are all people who have a low acuity uh, COVID-19. Um, and so they're, you know, the intention is for them to convalesce to um, you know, be watched, uh, you know, as patients will be at these alternate care facilities, and they'll be there for as long as it will take them to recover. And Dr. I don't know that there's much to add. So, like you said, there's five patients there. Um, they are, we only have, uh, like, level two uh, capability, and that was the intent. So they're not, you know, on vents or in ICU-type setting. There are people who... Uh, were deemed appropriate to leave the hospital, but not quite ready to go home. And so probably won't be extended stays, um, but we obviously we have the staff and we have the personnel uh, and we have all the equipment to treat them there until they're ready to make their final transition to, to home. Does that mean the hospitals are full and that's why so we, we do, um, we follow the bed availability, how many med surge beds, how many ICU beds, how many vents, how many ICUs. Um, so we are not, there are individual hospitals that may be full, but in terms of uh, all hospitals in a region, we divide our hospitals, uh, our 211 hospitals, into 10, uh, to 11 regions. Uh, region 7 through 11 form uh, the suburbs, uh, the, you know, Chicago land, if you will, the Chicago and the metro area. So there's no region that has no beds, but individual hospitals can get uh, to capacity, and so um, that would have resulted in some of the transfers that we have seen there. Governor, was there any talk about extending the school year into the summer or adjusting next year's school year? And also, what does this do to the stay-at-home order? To the state, uh, the sorry. The stay-at-home order. Yeah. I, I'll make decisions about the stay-at-home order uh, as I do, you know, all, everything else on a day-by-day -day basis following it, and I'll let you know as soon as I know. Uh, I, I did not consider uh, what would happen midsummer, or, you know, there are, obviously, there are summer school programs and other things that may take place, but... Uh, but at the moment, you know, we felt like this was the right answer. We wanted to make sure that the kids got e-learning opportunity that was already being set up for them because many of them, you know, their spring vac vacations were at the end of March or early April. So they've been a couple weeks at least into e-learning. Uh, they may have even started it before their uh, spring break. And, uh, and so, you know, that's all set up for people as they go into May. And, you know, we think it gives people an opportunity to finish out the school year um, in an as appropriate a fashion as they can, yeah. Governor, can you expand on the grading, the non-grading, and really what does compliance mean? Yeah. Um, it, it's, we're not intended to say non-grading or grading. It's just, a, a, you know, we, we want students and to be treated with, um, you know, with enough understanding that, uh, you know, teachers are not uh, using it as a compliance tool to give them a bad grade because, uh, you know, they don't have an internet connection or the internet connection is spotty uh, or, uh, you know, they, you know they're, they're, these are sometimes difficult circumstances. People are not used to kids, are not used to being home uh, and doing schooling. And so, you know, there needs to be more understanding. And that's really the point of the comments that I was making. Governor, regarding... Um graduation ceremonies for seniors, for eighth graders. Yeah. Um, are you ruling out the possibility of some type of ceremony once the stay-at-home order is lifted, perhaps even in August or September for those students who might want them? 
Oh, no, I'm not ruling out that, that possibility. And, and, you know, again, the stay-at-home order, no decision's been made about the extension of it. But to your question, could that occur in August or September? No, of course. I, I mean, I feel for these students. I have two teenagers. They're not, they don't happen to be graduating this year. But I can imagine, you know, just given their friendships and their groups of friends and, um, you know, and I know what this time of year means to uh, people who are graduating from, from eighth grade or even fourth grade or fifth grade, um, and of course from high school. So, no, I, I hope that we'll find ways to celebrate even now, uh, or at least at the end of the, you know, what would have been the normal school year, uh, and that, you know, we find unique ways to do that online, and then, you know, as soon as people are able to gather, um, I know that there will be celebrations planned, and I'm looking forward to that. Hi, Governor, Amy Jacobson, Hi, WYND. Amy. Um, also a CPS high school coach, so this is a, it's a rough day for all of us, but yeah. uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida is letting parents choose whether or not to redo the school year. Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility here? Redo? I redo the school year. So, because like, we missed three weeks. You mean have weeks. a child well, go back? Yeah, we missed three weeks in the fall because of the yeah. strikes. And now this, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of, you know, construction time in the classrooms, in yeah. sports. Can we have them start the year over? In the summer or in the fall? You in mean, I'm fall. not sure. Yeah, in the yeah. Fall. I haven't looked at what Governor DeSantis is doing, so, but I understand the, I guess, the basis of your question. Um, certainly something we, we could look at. I mean, it's not something that we've contemplated right now, um, given the amount of time that's left in the school year and the fact that some school districts, many school districts, do have a pretty good e-learning program uh, in place so they can get much of the instruction done. But I recognize that there are kids who may not get as much and therefore, you know, something like that might work. But I'll, I'll go look at what Governor DeSantis has announced. Thank you. Yeah. This may be a question for the doctor, but today was the biggest one-day jump in cases. Do you expect this to keep happening? And if so, and are you sure the curve is flattening if the you know numbers keep increasing? And do you expect those numbers to keep increasing? So I, I'm sure we both have an answer to that. So forgive me. I'll just give you a short version and let the doctor speak. Um, I, Look, it's it's never encouraging to see a number you know go up and not down um, in this circumstance. Um, the the number I want to go down, uh, you know, the numbers I want to go down are cases, hospitalizations, ICU beds, people on ventilators, and of course the fatalities. Um, and and we look at hospitalizations as really the most important of those numbers. At least I do. Cases, remember, are dependent upon how many people got tested that day. And we all know that all across the country, very few people have been tested. So it's almost hard to make some judgments about that, but we watch it. You saw that this was our second highest day for testing. We had, I think, 7,300 uh, tests that, were, that came back today. And that leads to, of course, a higher you know, nominal amount of, uh, of people who are tested positive. There are lots of people out there, unfortunately, who don't get tested who are COVID positive. And so the more we test, the more we're going to see, uh, you know, test positive. So the thing I would track, I mean, that's a, we, we look at it, but the bigger, mo more important number is really the number of hospitalizations and ICU beds, you know, for, for several reasons, but the most important of which is if people are s sick enough to go to the hospital, that's a definite signal, you know, that someone is, you know, COVID-19 positive, likely, you know, if they have a respiratory issue. Um, and then, of course, ICU beds are, you know, a worsening of that condition. Doc, do you have anything? Yeah. Um, he usually says it all. Um, <laughs> I will say that, yes, we continue to follow trends. We follow trends for a lot of pieces of data. We follow the trends for cases. We follow the trends uh, for fatalities. We're following uh, the bed counts and how uh, people are showing up to the hospital. We're looking at emergency room visits that translate into uh, admissions. So uh, all of these numbers help us to make you know, assessments and determinations. Uh, definitely, we did not think we were at our peak yet. So given that, we do expect cases to rise. Um, and so that is an important um, thing to, to understand. And, and really another important part is with the flattening of the curve, if I, I mean, I don't have the picture, but if, if you have this kind of curve, but you flattened it, it means it takes longer to get to the lower peak, but it takes longer to get there. So one of the byproducts of being able to flatten the curve is that you will delay, uh, delay the peak. And maybe it's not a peak where you go straight up and down, but maybe, if I can use the term, plateau, 
where you're kind of flattened for a while. So again, we're looking at all these numbers to figure out exactly where we are in our in our curve, um, and as it's really a day by day thing, and then you look at weak trends. So we're not we're not exactly surprised that we would see more cases. There is the extra um, fact of you know how many tests were done versus on one day versus another. So again, we're following all that. We are continuing to increase our amount of testing. So if the denominator, if you will, of total people being tested is increased, um, we we'll see higher numbers. So we'll take that into account, but definitely uh, all the numbers are being evaluated every single day, and we are making you know, the best educated guesses out of the trends that we see from the data. I don't think we've peaked. Okay, we'll go to questions from other reporters not in the room. From Tony Arnold at WBEZ, have you been briefed on the clinical trials happening at the University of Chicago that seem to show promising results for treating COVID with an anti-HIV drug called remdesivir. Is this an indication that there's a treatment coming? I have not been briefed, but I read the same materials that probably Tony Arnold read uh, this morning in particular. Um, I'm following very closely a number of the trials uh, because it's very important when we talk about what does the future look like, the first really important thing that will happen while we're building up testing, while we're doing contact tracing, is that the uh, approval of a therapy or treatment that will diminish people's likelihood of either being hospitalized or after they're hospitalized being put in ICU or on a ventilator. This is from the patch for Dr. Azike. Do community health centers tasked with conducting new testing announced yesterday have the ability to report results to public health officials the same way hospitals provide the data? If so, specifically, how will they do it? If not, will the testing data not be reported on public health roles and limit the state's ability to track the virus? No, that's a great question. It's very important that we have the data for every test that happens in the state of Illinois. We're using all of that data. It's very sensitive. Uh, all of the FQHCs, any of the uh, additional clinics that come on board will be sending their specimens to a place where the labs will be processed who will now send all of those results to IDPH. Most of those uh, testing specimens will actually be sent directly to IDPH to be run, and of course we'll have the results, but even if they are sent to another, uh, to a university or a hospital where they are run, they will still be sent to us, usually uh, electronically through our electronic lab system. This is from Hannah at the Daily Line. Considering the school funding changes you had planned to make for next year in your February budget proposal, what will happen with school with funding schools with the evidence-based school funding formula next year, given the disproportionate impact e-learning will have on poorer districts? Will any proration of the school funding formula again become the norm? Well, I didn't plan any reduction of the funding for evidence-based funding, just to be clear. Um, as you know, we we put forward a budget that would have fully funded uh, the $350 million for evidence-based funding. Um, so, uh, so that, and in terms of what would happen if there's a reduction of evidence-based funding model, it's actually written into the law what would happen. Uh, there would be a reduction uh, that would focus on the tier one and tier two schools in EBF uh, less than, you know, and therefore the tier three and tier four schools would receive less. This is from Shia Politico. How is Illinois going to find and train contact tracers? Where are they coming from and who is paying them? Great question, and my uh, short answer to that is that um, if you look at what Massachusetts did, and there's a terrific article about this in the New York Times that gives you a pretty good uh, sense of it, although I have some materials uh, that I've received directly from them, um, you can see how this is done. But yes, you know, we'll be hiring, we would be hiring people. Um, it does cost to pay people to hire them, uh, of course, but uh, the important uh, part of this collaborative is it's a very important component of getting the economy going again and getting people, you know, out of the situation that we're in today, along with, as I've always said, testing and, of course, uh, a treatment. This is from Jamie Monks at the Chicago Tribune. With the highest to date number of known cases being reported in a single day and the high number of deaths in a single day reported yesterday, what do you attribute that to and what evidence shows that the state is in fact bending the curve or no? Mm -hmm. um, well, the first thing that people should take note of is that, and we talked about this the other day, the doubling times. You know, how long does it take to double the number of cases uh, in a state? How long does it take to double the number of fatalities in a state. We have seen the, the length of time that takes to double 
increased significantly, uh, even more than I reported the other day. It's actually increasing that that uh, that doubling time, and that's a very good thing. That's a good thing. D we have not peaked. I think you just heard uh, Dr. Zike say that, and I will uh, repeat it. Uh, we are in a period where I, you know, we, where again you can feel, you can see it bending this curve because we know what the projections were had we not put the stay-at-home order in place much worse than where we are today. And we can see the slowing of the development of people ending up in hospitals and in uh, ICU beds and in vent on ventilators. And so, and remember that the fatalities often are uh, a lagging indicator. The, the cases are, are maybe a leading indicator. Hospitalizations, though, are the most definite indicator of where you are on the curve. And we're seeing, again, a flattening of that. We saw a, a really significant upward trend of it, and then we saw it sort of flattening. And I want to make sure that, you know, there was a question about flattening and flat. It's flattening. It, you know, the curve is bending, but it isn't flat yet. I mean, I would like it to be flat, and then we know at least or we can have some confidence that it may start falling. But either way, you know, whether you're on this side of the curve or that, we will have increasing numbers of cases, just, I mean, total cases in the state, um, whether that number of daily cases is falling or not. And same thing, of course, for all the other numbers on the other side of this. Rebecca Ansel from Capital News, Illinois, would like to check in with Governor Pritzker and Dr. Azike. How are you both doing physically and emotionally? Has holding these daily updates gotten any easier? Well, that's so nice. Nobody ever <laughs> asks that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, has it gotten easier? Uh, well, I mean, I've, I've gotten to know many of you uh, better than I did. Uh, uh, so for me, anyway, I'll just say I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm uh, managing through this time, uh, you know, reasonably well. I think I... I, um, you know, some people have said about me that I, you know, what is, you know, what does Governor Pritzker like to do when he's not working? And the answer most people give is work. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I think I can do and, and I'm, uh, but I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. I think the, the, there is an emotional component to this that I'll just, you know, not spend a lot of time on. But, you know, when I wake up in the morning and I look at the numbers um, of re being reported in the morning uh, about what happened overnight and in the evening before, um, it you know, sometimes, I mean, uh, the numbers are, uh, you know, when we have a day like yesterday, it's, it's uh, hard not to let it uh, get you down. Uh, but, um, you know, I know that if we persist, if everybody persists out there with the stay-at-home order following the rules um, and we keep building up our testing and our contact tracing, you know, we'll do better every day. So, oh. yep. um, No, it's, uh, I can't complain. I got a day off, unlike you. <laughs> so, so I was off uh, last Sunday, but um, we have a, an important job. Um, I guess we were called to our roles for such a time as this, and so we are embracing it. Um, I am so humbled to be under the leadership of the governor, who is a tireless advocate for the people of Illinois, and he inspires all of us to work just as hard as he is. Um, we, we have a mission. We have a mission. We have a war that we're facing. Um, and we need to make sure that people understand the enemy and understand how to defend themselves against the enemy and need to understand that it's going to be a long war. And so we're making sure that the governor is working so hard with his team to make sure that while we face this war that we, you know, we have the things that we need given the tough circumstances, we're trying to make sure that we're accurately looking at the data to make sure that we fully understand the enemy and are using the right tactics to fight back. I think we're doing that. Um, but. Uh, I'm privileged to be in this position to try to help the people of the state, and I think uh, I'm finding the strength that I need to carry on. Thank you for asking. Rich Miller at Capital Facts asks, are the scientists you consult saying anything about actions you can take to cause a, quote, downward trajectory of documented cases within a 14-day period to quote the new White House guidance? Mm. Um, there aren't, there isn't some specific action uh, that you can do that leads to a downward trajectory. Uh, what you can do is keep doing the things you're doing that are slowing the ascent of the curve. And there are a few other things you can do. You know, I talked the other day about uh, one of the state reps had suggested that people who work in grocery stores and other uh, stores should be required to wear masks. I have encouraged everybody to wear a mask when they're out in public. 
um, can, you know, if we, perhaps if we enforce that more, uh, or if people just enforced it with, um, you know, by talking to people as they see them on the street, um, you know, I think that's a, uh, that, that's another way that we could do it. But there isn't something specific. I wish I could tell you, you know, we don't live in a, um, in a dictatorial society. You know, we, we don't live in an authoritarian world. Um, we, this is a, you know, it's a free country and we want to make sure that we are observing people's civil liberties while keeping them safe. And that's the balance that we're trying to strike here. Molly Parker at the Southern Illinois and will be our last question. Is Randolph County on the state's radar given that you have two large facilities there, Menard Correctional Center and Chester Mental Health? Can you describe mm -hmm. what efforts you may have in place there given that they are somewhat of a hot spot in Southern Illinois? Yeah. Um, so just so you know, we're, we're watching every county in Illinois. I mean, we see, you hear us uh, reporting on cases in counties. Um, and the numbers of counties in part, and you can read about it at IDPH, um, in part we, we make sure you know about the number of counties because we want people to know uh, what's going on across the state. This isn't just a Cook County or a Chicago uh, issue. This really is happening everywhere. That's number one. And number two, with regard to uh, congregate facilities, and we've talked about this quite a lot, um, the the uh, congregate facilities of every type are being surveilled by us all the time. Talked, we are talking to the leaders and managers of those facilities. Uh, we are delivering PPE. We're making sure that there are guidelines for them to follow, guidance given by IDPH to make sure that we're caring for those people as best we can. Those are very difficult circumstances. Just to be clear, it's happening all over the country. When you put for example, seniors together in a congregate facility, they, they can't easily be moved around. Um, and, you know, in a nursing home, just as one example. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, but, but they are. We're, we're moving them. We're making sure that we're separating. There's a lot of PPE. We're giving a lot of guidance to the people who run those facilities. Same thing for a correctional institution. You've seen that we brought the National Guard in to uh, Stateville. Um, you know, we're looking at other places where we might want to deploy them uh, and uh, making sure that we're bringing even more uh, medical facilities or making more medical facilities available to uh, the staff and to the inmates themselves. All right, thank you, everyone. Yep, thank you.